It's Tuesday, November 7th, 2023. And this is Uranium Spotlight, your weekly podcast dedicated to delivering the latest news and events shaping the uranium fuel market and its critical role in the global energy landscape. Brought to you by PurePoint Uranium Group, trading on the TSX Venture and the OTCQB. PurePoint actively operates a portfolio of advanced uranium projects in the world's richest uranium district and has established partnerships with some of the largest uranium suppliers worldwide. While our passion for this subject is undeniable, it's essential to clarify that the information presented here is not investment advice. Instead, our goal is to offer an unbiased and comprehensive review of recent events that could impact uranium pricing. And now your host, Chris Frostad. This week on Uranium Spotlight, we see the effects of Finland and Germany's differing approaches to net zero. France looks to make closer ties with Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. We see new reactors continuing to pile up and uranium companies report on Q3. Looking back at October, the uranium market saw increased activity in spot and term transactions with 43 spot deals involving various fuel forms, mostly for prompt delivery. U308 dominated these transactions. Additionally, the term market had nine awards covering different components such as U308, UF6, conversion services, and SWU, indicating a generally active month. This past week, the spot price of uranium moved only slightly, closing up 15 cents at $74.15 US per pound U308. Recent activity indicates a cool down in the uranium market. Last week, there were only six confirmed spot transactions, all for prompt delivery. The spot price remained at $74 per pound until later when it increased to $74.55 due to some interest. Yet as the week progressed, prices fluctuated, but ultimately settled at $73.75 after a deal on Friday. Cameco and Arano deliveries fell to $73.50, while Converdine increased to $74.25 per pound. This reflects an overall decline in pricing for uranium, suggesting weakening demand and increased competitiveness in the market. Finland and Germany are two countries that have taken radically different paths to get to the same goal of eventual decarbonization of the energy sector and net zero emissions. Finland's clean energy sector has seen tremendous growth, with nuclear making up 35% of Finland's total energy generation and clean energy making up an enormous 85% of Finland's overall power generation, their decarbonization strategy has achieved record success. Finland's nuclear production this year was buoyed by the introduction of the third reactor at Finland's second nuclear power plant and their fifth reactor overall. Finland also uses a large amount of wind and hydropower and complements that with wood-based fuels to ensure a robust supply of clean energy all year round. In addition, Finland has a near microscopic amount of solar, although this amount has increased in recent years. Finland has seen smaller amounts of peat burning and fossil fuel use, which make up the remainder of their energy generation. While Finland has achieved 85% in clean energy, they've also weaned themselves off Russian energy imports and Russian natural gas, an important geopolitical objective for their government and many Western democracies worried about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Germany, on the other hand, recently shut off its remaining nuclear reactors and is now facing a winter where it may have to burn more fossil fuels to compensate. Germany attempted to accommodate the lack of clean energy with nuclear by building more wind and solar. But of course, where nuclear can run every day all year round, in the winter, solar is constrained by the fact that the days are shorter and therefore less energy is generated. With solar being Germany's second largest source of clean energy behind wind and the output from solar declining by 80% between September and December, Germany will need some fossil fuels to pick up the slack. All this means that while Finland is going to be enjoying a high proportion of clean energy all year round, Germany is going to be faced with increased winter CO2 emissions from a dirtier energy sector. Emmanuel Macron, president of France, has made a diplomatic trip this week to Central Asian republics of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. While Macron had several topics to cover on this trip, the first such trip by a president in France since 1994, the topic of uranium and nuclear energy was never far from the top of the list. France, which consumes 8,000 tons of uranium every year, is looking for new supplies of uranium since the coup in Niger this year put some 20% of France's supply of the critical mineral at risk. Kazakhstan holds a large supply of uranium, but has promised much of it to its powerful next-door neighbors, Russia and China. 
While Kazakhstan does currently supply 37% of France's uranium and Uzbekistan 12%, both of those numbers will probably need to rise in coming years to meet a growing disconnect between supply and demand, both as geopolitical instability continues in some regions of the world and as countries, including France, look to build more nuclear reactors. Macron left Uzbekistan with no firm commitments, but with a general agreement to foster strategic ties. And in the case of Kazakhstan, the Kazakh president said that the two sides had signed a joint declaration on strategic minerals cooperation. Many Central Asian countries are reluctant to totally disavow Russia. However, they are also intimidated by the precedent set by Russia's invasion of Ukraine last year, causing relations to sour. Macron, no doubt, saw an opportunity in this to increase France's own at-risk supplies of the important nuclear fuel. This week, several developments occurred in the ever-growing reactor space. A new reactor has come online in Belarus, and another one has completed its cold testing phase in China. A third reactor, this one a small modular reactor, also in China, reached the major milestone of having its containment dome successfully lowered into place. Small modular reactors are a new technology designed to lower the costs and build time of traditional reactors. In other small modular reactor news, several EU member states urged the European Commission to create an alliance for small modular reactors. This will allow states to cooperate more closely on building the said reactors. In other reactor news, the Armenian government is looking at extending the lifespan of its singular reactor to 2036. The Japanese company Kansai Electric Power Company has applied to Japan's Nuclear Regulatory Authority for an extension of one of its reactors, and elsewhere the Japanese government has approved the lifespan extension of two reactors. The government of Ukraine has also approved a 10-year lifespan extension for its South Ukraine NPP, and in the United Kingdom, EDF was awarded a contract for the lifespan extension of Sizewell B. All in all, with reactor lifespan extensions keeping the price of uranium from slipping, and new reactors coming online at a regular pace, demand for uranium is projected to continue soaring over the coming years. Last week saw many of the producers releasing their Q3 results. Chemical Corp. reported net earnings of $148 million Canadian for the third quarter and to September 30th, 2023, compared to a net loss of $20 million Canadian for the same period of 2022. Kazataprom's Q3 2023 production slipped 7%, However, they are revising their 2023 sales and revenue outlook higher. UR Energy posted their Q3 results as 15,759 pounds U308 at their Lost Creek ISR project. Energy Fuels Inc. reported a net profit of $10.6 million U.S. for the third quarter ended September 30th, compared to a net loss of $9.3 million for the same period a year ago. During Q3, the company completed the sale of 180,000 pounds of U308 to a major U.S. nuclear utility for $10.5 million, or $58.18 per pound U308, which resulted in a gross profit of $5.2 million, or $28.93 per pound U308. On the development side, Encore Energy Corp. announced last week that the Texas Commission of Environmental Quality approved its radioactive materials license for its combined South Texas ISR uranium central processing plants at its Rosita, Kingsville Dome, and Vasquez Uranium projects. Denison Mines reported the successful completion of the recovered solution management phase of the Phoenix ISR feasibility field test at its Wheeler River project, as well as its successful completion of the inaugural ISR field test program for the Hell Death II uranium deposit at its majority-owned Waterbury Lake uranium project, both located in northern Saskatchewan, Canada. And that wraps up your Uranium Spotlight coverage for this week. For more news and events from the world of uranium, please tune in next week to Uranium Spotlight. You've been listening to Uranium Spotlight, your weekly podcast dedicated to delivering the latest news and events shaping the uranium fuel market and its critical role in the global energy landscape. Brought to you by PurePoint Uranium Group, advancing its position as the premier uranium explorer in the world's richest uranium district. Join us again next week for Uranium Spotlight.